This teaching you are about to listen to is brought to you by Pastors Christopher and Vera Orobo, powered by Today's Challenge International. Oh yes! Yes, Lord! I'm truly, truly excited this morning to welcome every one of us to the Christian Teachers Summit for 2019. Amen. I thought somebody was going to clap and give God praise. We are truly excited about that. We are truly excited about God gathering us again. We are truly excited that God has brought us again. I want to welcome every single one of us, trusting that the Lord will be speaking to us throughout the course of today. You know, the pastor, Pastor Precious, who was leading us, mentioned how... Um, a veteran in the profession said the profession is dead. But we thank God because if God had given up on this profession, he wouldn't be calling us together like this. So we know that there is hope. Amen. We know that there is hope. We know that God is still set to do what he had in mind for calling us into this profession. This year, as we were preparing for the summit we were praying and asking God so what should be the focus this year and that is how this theme came about my dear teacher you know and as I sat over there looking at the banner I don't know whether it's the same everywhere but this boy's eyes were just looking at me is he looking at you there and in the eye I saw like an appeal can you see it I saw like a begging. I saw like, can somebody help me? So this summit today, as the Lord has laid it on our hearts, is to look at our profession, the teaching profession, of which I have been a part for more than 30 years, to look at this profession, and especially from the standpoint of the children to which we have been called to to um, minister as it were in this church this opening church i have um, titled it my dear teacher inscribe your law on my heart this first church i have called it my dear teacher inscribe your law on my heart my dear teacher inscribe your law on my heart because i hear the resounding cry of the young child to the teacher that God has entrusted his or her life to. And the cry of the child is, my dear teacher, my dear teacher, inscribe your law on my heart. My dear teacher, inscribe your law on my heart. My dear teacher, inscribe your law, carve your law on my heart. My dear teacher, do something beyond just flinging out information in class. Inscribe your law on my heart. And I'd like to take our text this morning from Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 verse 16. Jesus was ministering and there were certain young children that wanted to come to him. And the disciples was, were shooing them away. Like, this man is too busy, doesn't have time for small children. We are doing important ministry here, you are talking about children. What has children got to do, the, do with this? We are looking for adults, people who can reason. And they were driving the children away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that Luke 18 verse 16, the Bible says, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer so little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. They were driving away the children. Send them away. These are not important people. We need important people. We need professors. We need doctors. We need lawyers. What are these children hanging around here for? Please get away from here. We don't need you here. When Jesus saw it, he was displeased. He was displeased and he turned to his disciples and said, Allow those children to come here. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. 
Every time God looks at a young child, he's looking beyond that age of that child. Every time God looks at a young child, he's looking at the future. He's looking at the destiny that he had planned for that child. For those disciples that shoot those children away, they were looking at this pot belly small boy. But Jesus was looking at what he could turn that boy into. He said, allow those children to come. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, every small child, whether uh, um, uh, adult, uh, ad young um, toddlers, whether teenagers, whatever the age, so far is a young child, they are important to God. Every young child is important to God. So don't send them away. Let them come. And I do know that even in the classroom where you are teaching, especially if you are at the nursery level, at the primary level, there's a temptation to look at those children as small children. Please, let me just do whatever I can do to keep them occupied. But Jesus said, of such is the future. Of such is the future. Of such is the future. And Jesus now invested time on those children. The Bible says he laid his hands on them and blessed them. Invested time. Invested prayer. Because those children were important to him. The resounding cry of the teacher, of the child to the teacher, carve your law, inscribe your law on my heart. Why this cry? Why are the children crying? Why are the, 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 the young children in the, in the nursery, the primary, why are they crying? Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. In Habakkuk chapter 2, the prophecy of Habakkuk, verse 2. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. It says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. That is, inscribe the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Why the cry? People cannot run until something has deliberately been inscribed on their life. The reason why many people cannot run today to the fulfillment of their destiny was that there was an omission of a teacher when they were young. That teacher may even be their own parents because the first teacher that a child is exposed to is a mother and the father at home. The reason why many people's destinies have become mad is that there was no deliberate writing of the vision. Some of them destined to be great professors, but nobody deliberately wrote the vision in their hearts. Nobody took time to deliberately inscribe their destiny for them to see. And so they grew up. Now we have graduates who cannot write a simple letter of application. The other day we wanted to employ some people in church and we said go and write application. These were graduates. I was shocked to see letters arriving. People with uh, M. Ed., uh, sorry, B-Ed, people with uh, B-A, people with B-S-C, writing letters. What has crippled these people to the extent that right now, even the basic thing they cannot do? Because at some point, nobody deliberately took time to write the vision on their hearts. My fellow teacher, I don't know, when you see that child in your class, does it occur to you that there is a deliberate vision for the life of this child? You may see the child as a young person who is just running around in the class. But God sees this person as somebody with a great destiny. And our privilege as teachers is that God has positioned us to be the ones to write that vision on their hearts. Where this child knows beyond a shadow of doubt, I am not supposed to be a non-entity. I am not supposed to end up a useless nobody. But you know, the pain becomes 
when the Christian teacher doesn't understand that this is the reason for my election as a Christian teacher, instead of writing a vision of success, inadvertently, the teacher begins to write a vision of defeat. Look at you, stubborn idiot. Goat. You have no brain. You are not going to go anywhere. You know that you are writing a different kind of vision. And that vision you are writing is not the one that God put you in that position to write. If these children that are under our care are to run to the fulfillment of their God-given destiny, we as teachers have been given the privilege to write very clearly what that future will be for them. I believe, and I strongly believe this, that no student, no child, was particularly born without a destiny. No child was born without a destiny. I'm reminded of the story of Esther. We all know the story of Esther in scriptures. We know that if there was one girl that shouldn't have become anything in life, it's Esther. Because this girl, at a very tender age, was already an orphan. Not that she was already an orphan alone. The Bible says she was now in captivity. So everything in her, in her youthful age was already set towards defeat and failure. But I thank God. Amen. I thank God that she had a teacher in her life. She had a teacher in, in the person of her uncle who sat her down and deliberately began to teach this young girl. Esther, you have a destiny. Esther, there's somewhere you are going. Esther, you are going to be somebody. And so when suddenly Vashti misbehaved and there was a new queen that needed to be put in place, Mordecai told Esther, apply. And as Esther applied, was giving her, still teaching her how to enter into her destiny. I am just asking in this place this morning, as I sense the Lord, doesn't want to, we don't want to do a lot of preambles today. We just want to go straight to the issues. I see the Lord asking, who is that teacher that will rise up like Mordecai and say, I will be the one to write destiny in the life of this child. I will be the one to ensure that these children that have been placed under my care, they are not going to be useless non-entities. In fact, what gain do I have as a teacher? If because of my input or lack of input, the children that were under my age, under my care, they become damaged in their destiny. Sometimes people may come in and say, I see that one, that Agbero. I, I, I teach him. I say, I teach him. And sometimes teachers are saying it as if it is a credit. You are saying it as if it is a credit, it is a qualification. That the child that was under your care somehow became malformed and has ended up as Agbero. And you, you thought it was something to jubilate about. But for Mordecai, Esther who was just an orphan, and I don't know the kind of children that are in your class. Some are orphans. Some cannot even pay school fees. I don't know if you saw that video that went viral the other day. That's a success girl. How many of you saw it? They go flock, 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 flock. And you know that girl is a dramatist. They go flock, flock, flock. They go tire. Just listening to that girl, you can see that that girl has something. Am I right? That girl has something. And that cry that she's saying they will flock, flock, flock. A teacher can interpret that as this girl is too stubborn. But I wish you can look at that girl from a different perspective. And see somebody that is crying for expression. See somebody that is crying that, oh my God, am I going to end up just being driven out of class like this? Like this. You know the girl was even saying, it's better they keep her in class and be flogging her. Eh? Does that not show a child that wants to go somewhere? I don't know the kind of children that are in your class. And somehow you have given up on some of them. I said, as for this one, nothing. Nothing. And in fact, you have joined the enemy to be calling them names, to inscribe negative vision in their eyes. I pray that the Lord will help you this morning. I said, I pray that the Lord will help you this morning. 
So no child was particularly born without a destiny and no child was born without a capacity to learn. No child. Even if you see those imbeciles, they have capacity to learn at their own level. Every child has capacity to learn. That is why if you look at the philosophy of education, you look at our philosophy of education, you see that we normally say that a child can become anything depending on how he or she is handled, what he or she is exposed to, and the environment in which he or she is developed. Any child can become anything depending on how that child is handled. Depending on what the child is exposed to and depending on the environment. Was it an accommodating environment? Was it a loving environment? Was that child under a teacher that loved his profession? Or the child was under a teacher that was angry? Angry. Angry because he was already angry from home. And was not going to put the best in the life of the students. Every child can become something. Now this example is not really a, a classroom example. But there's a man of God, or there was a man of God by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. This was a very powerful man of God. He was um, a British citizen. One day he went to preach. And where he came to preach, there was another young man who was just coming up in ministry. And when he looked at the young man, and the other guest speakers were powerful speakers. And he was in charge of the meeting. You know what he did? He told the young man, you will be the first to speak. I will just go up there and charge up the atmosphere you come preach. So that that boy will not be intimidated. When he hear all the big, big men of God with their exposition, eh? his, his zeal, his, 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 his small energy will finish. He made that boy speak. When the boy finished speaking, he said, see me afterwards. See me afterwards. Come to my house and see me. For the next seven years, he sat over the life of that young man until he became an international preacher. When I heard that story, it touched my heart. That a person can look at another young person and see greatness to be nurtured. Please listen to me. If you see with only physical eyes, you may not see the greatness in your students to be nurtured. You may not see anything to invest. But I pray that the Lord will open your eyes. I pray that the Lord will open your eyes. To see that every single child has capacity to become something. Something great in life. If only I can invest. Especially in our teaching, we, we, of course we know that when we talk about learning in a classroom situation, we normally say that learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior. Those of you that are not educationists, that's, you didn't read education, you may not know this. That learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior or behavior potentiality. That is to say that I went to class as an English teacher and I was just giving the students information does not mean that I have done my job. In education, you have not done your job until there is a change, a permanent change in the behavior of that student. Do you know that there are some children that would have become doctors? Eh? You know what made them never to become doctor? Their math teacher. Their math teacher in JS1 was the problem. Because when that teacher came to class, whether the students were sleeping, whether they were awake, was none of his business. And this was supposed to be a Christian teacher. He was just talking, talking. If the children even ventured to ask, because they shut up there. What have I taught that, that you don't understand? Uh-uh. Blockhead. And you know, what you have done is that you have permanently silenced that child's inquisitiveness to learn. Even though I wasn't a great uh, math student, I made F9 in math, praise God. I traced it to my teacher. Because I got to university and got another teacher for statistics and I made A in statistics. I found out that a subject like mass is even so easy. Eh? If I bought five bananas for 100 naira. Now, if somebody gives you 1,000 naira, how many bananas can you buy with it? 
Do you know that if you didn't teach the students well, the first question we ask is, Ma, I have not even seen 1,000 with my eye. How can I know how many bananas I can use it to buy? Is anybody getting me? So the child does not even see how he can apply what you have taught in the classroom to a real life situation. But when I go to class and I do my job, what I am looking for is that this child not only engages with the course in class, but that after he leaves the class, he can apply it. So you teach him a little physics, chemistry, all those things, and he gets home and he looks at the mother's gas and the thing is bringing a red flame. Say, no, why is this thing bringing red flame? And the child begins to do, do, do. And mother says, I better not spoil my girl. So, not spoil my girl. Say, mommy, just relax. This thing is not supposed to be red flame. It's supposed to be blue. Mommy, put your hand like this. Put your hand. You see that? You see the heat? Let me do it. Let it be blue. As soon as it's turned to blue, he said, put it again. The blue flame is hot. I said, should I tell you why? You know why the child is able to do that? He had a teacher. He had a teacher that taught him until the behavioral change was that was desired became part of his life now please i want us to to know that our principles and philosophy of education is based on this that as a teacher when my students have not really really understood what i have taught i just went there went there to waste their time i went there to waste my own time go to colossians chapter 4 colossians chapter 4 Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians 4, I want to direct your attention to verse 17. Verse 17. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou has received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now, please, I want you to understand that as a Christian teacher, do we have a ministry? Oh, please talk to me. Do we have a ministry? What is our ministry? To teach, to inscribe on the life of our students. He said, take heed, take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. Be careful. Stay focused so that you may fulfill the ministry you have received from your principal. Oh, are there people here? Please look at the scripture. Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received from your principal. Is that what it says? The ministry which you have received from Governor Okowa. Hello? Hello, teachers. The ministry you have received from your HM. The ministry you have received from who? That is where many people are missing it. They think it is my proprietors that gave me this uh, job. Some people think, for those of us that are government workers, it's Okowa that gave us work. Some people think it was uh, the CIEs. But may I inform you this morning, in case you didn't know, that the ministry of a teacher is a ministry handed over to us by the Lord. There may be some of you that it was not your plan to teach. You just stumbled into the profession. Whether you stumbled into it or it was your plan, like it has always been my plan to be a teacher. But some of you, you probably look for a job here, look for a job everywhere you couldn't find. You say, let me be managing this one first. Whether you are managing this one first or it was a deliberate choice, I want you to understand that so long as you are in the profession, it is a ministry that you have received from who, please? And may I tell you, it is a fearful thing when a person loses sight of who his true caller is. It's a fearful thing when you lose sight of who your real employer is. It's a fearful thing when you lose sight of the one who called you to the profession. I want you to understand that the one who called us to the profession is not our 
immediate employee. It is the Lord. It is the Lord that put you there and said, please, take care of these children for me. No. If God is the one that said, take care of these children for me, can you afford to do this work like adesically? The answer is no. You know, as a teacher myself, sometimes you are very, very tired. And there are sometimes that, bodily speaking, you, you, are, you, are, you are just not up there. But when you remember who called you to this work, and you remember that it's 10, maybe it's 13 weeks or 15 weeks. If I am negligent, these children are going to miss something that they can never recover. You don't understand. That if I am negligent, as my, if you are teaching a JS1 a class, for example, and the students come in that JS1, and the first time you are supposed to teach them basic things in grammar, but you were negligent and you didn't teach them. I hope you know that forever, that damage is permanent. Because when the child gets to second term, the teacher is not going to go back to the work you ought to have done in the first term. And this is what makes this thing so critical. When I keep noting within myself, Vera, Vera, the one who put this work in your hand is God, though. It's God. And you know, I told you, I think last year or the other year, if there is one profession that doesn't have applause from men, is this our profession? Am I right? You go for a party, they say, now we want to welcome barrister so-and-so, we want to welcome engineer so-and-so, we want to welcome professor so-and-so, we want to welcome uh, architect so-and-so, how many times do they say we want to welcome teacher Grace? <laughs> so if you go by the way we are even treated and sometimes even the children you are trying to help don't even understand that you are trying to help them. Their parents can even come and make trouble up and down. But when you remember that the person to whom I am accountable it's not this child. It's not his parents. It's not even my proprietor. Then I settle down to say, God, I cannot fail you in this responsibility. When you don't seem teaching as a ministry, you will not do it the way that pleases God. You know, many of us that are Christians, some of us are deacons, deaconesses in our churches. Some may even be pastors in our churches. May I tell you, that sometimes you take that pastoral work or deaconess work so serious in your church more than you take the teaching profession. But may I quickly inform you, in my own estimation, understanding the word of God, God will call you more accountable for these children. Lives he gave to you to mold and you, you just fiddled with it the way you like. He said, take it. It was like a warning. Take it to yourself. And I hear the Lord giving that very stern warning this morning. Some of you here, you may be uh, student uh, teachers. You are learning to be a teacher. I want you to note that there is a warning for this profession. Take heed to this ministry. Take heed to this ministry which you have received. Because you are, you are, you are, you are dealing with the lives of men. You are dealing with the destinies of men. You are dealing with the future of human beings. If we were to take care of uh, chairs and tables, no problem. If we were to take care of computers, no problem. But these are human lives. These are human lives. Small they may be right now, but these are human lives. And God is saying, take heed to the ministry which you have received from the Lord. So the teacher who makes it impossible for a child to enter into his destiny is going to account to God. If it was my failure that made that child not to be able to read law because I played with his literature. Eh? Please, are you listening to me? And we account to God. This child was supposed to be a lawyer. I brought him to your class to teach him literature. Suzanne. 
Suzanne, what were you doing that this child could not become a lawyer? What were you doing that you played with the time allocated to you to invest in this boy's life? And look at him now. Look at him now. He's selling newspaper at the corner of the road. When I gave you an opportunity to mold his destiny. Every teacher must strive to meet the aspirations of the caller. Every teacher has the privilege to write the destiny of his, the children under his care. And sometimes these children may not understand that you are trying to help them. Their parents may not understand. But being a teacher is a deliberate attempt to create a child into what he or she ought to be. And truly, the heart of every child is crying. You know, you know the cry here as I'm looking at this boy. My dear teacher, help me. My dear teacher, I'm very foolish now. Please help me. My dear teacher, I may be doing things wrong. Please help me. I want to be somebody. My dear teacher, will you not help me? I hear the child crying. Please, please, my teacher, help me not to become a wayward girl. My teacher, help me not to become a non-entity. My teacher, please help me. I hear the child crying. And you may complain. Uh -uh. Look at the school now. Population is too much. How can I mark 100 scripts in one class? And yet, every single one of the children in that class is crying. Please help me. Please help me. You may say, ah, That Jones is Jones crying. That stubborn goat. That one is not crying. That one even wants to fail. Excuse me. That is what you thought. That is what you thought. But somewhere in the inner recesses of his heart, that Jones is crying for help. You don't understand human psychology. That sometimes wrong behavior, aggressive behavior, out of the box behavior is actually a cry for help. Oh, teachers, do we not know this? Eh? In human developmental psychology, don't we know this? That sometimes behavior that is outrageous is actually an indirect cry for recognition that this person is crying for help. It is our privilege as teachers to create the future of the children that God has put in our hands. And the critical thing is that there is a time frame to get this done. What did I say? There is a time frame. I wish you have forever to invest on the children under your care, but you don't. There is a time frame and a time limit to achieve this. You know, I'm, I'm sure you all know about communism and Marxism. When Karl Marx got up and was spreading his satanic doctrine, taking over Russia, taking over China and places like that. He had a target population. He wasn't going for the adults. He didn't give a damn about the adults. His focus was on teenagers from the age of 12 to 18. Finish. 12 to 18. And his philosophy is that once I can get this age bracket finish. My philosophy will stand the test of time. And he did it. The mental change that he brought was not for the old people. It was for the young people. Ah, you see these people that are, that are rich? Nobody is supposed to be richer than the other. Everybody is supposed to be equal. So they see the rich people, they see them as, uh, as the, the oppressors and all that. And that's how communism took root. The emphasis was only on the young people. So even the devil knows that the age that you can actually do much good or much damage is not the old people. That's why the devil doesn't really care too much about an old man. If you put a young man here and you put an old man here and you tell the devil to choose, guess who he will choose? He will choose the young man. What is he doing with an old man? Have you ever seen that they call old men to go and fight political battles? Have you seen old men jumping up and down doing all these things? No. They know that the people to use 
to fight any battle in any generation are the young people. And that is the target. It was, um, what is this man's name? Ah, let me see. Hitler. Hitler was the one that said, if you want to destroy any nation, forget the old people, face the young. And that was what he did. When Daniel was taken to Babylon, I don't know if you ever sat down to think about that Daniel story. I mean, the king went to Israel, raided it, and took slaves. Why did they, were there no old people in Israel that time? Why did they choose teenagers? Then Daniel were all teenagers that they brought. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these were teenagers. Because they knew if you bring old men, old men are already set in their ways. It's hard to change them. Bring the young people we can write on their hearts. We can change their philosophy of life. That is why when ba them, Daniel them go to Babylon, the first thing that the king did, he called them, he said, change their names, change their names, change their names. We want them to think differently. They change their name. He said, teach them the literature of the Chaldeans. Teach them the arts, the music of the Chaldeans. What was he trying to do? We can change these ones. These ones are still malleable. They are still pliable. We can change them. Do you know that this is the group of people God has put in your hand? People that can still be molded. Thank God for adult education. No? But do you know that adult education is only remedial? Am I right? It's only remedial. The people that have missed it as young people and I'm, I'm glad that they have opportunity to, to do something. But do you know that what you can teach your student, your young child, in one hour, take it to adult education, you need one month. <laughs> because the brain is already set. Am I speaking the truth? But God has given these children to us at an age where, you know, if you remember your educational psychology, he said their mind is a tabula rasa. You remember tabula rasa? Yeah. So we can write. We can inscribe. We can put something. We can put something. We can put something. My question is, what are you going to put? I don't know if you people recall. Because you see, eh, when God told us to start this city, this Christian teacher summit, we prayed for years before we dared to attempt. Because we were asking teachers, will teachers agree to come? God said, do it. And many of you don't yet know what God is pursuing. Probably you thought every May 1st we just come here to gather. But let me show you a little bit of what the Lord is pursuing with these CTS. Do you know that a few years ago, if you were looking for a house boy or a house girl, Please, which states are you likely to look for them? That is why that time we have Akpan. We have Okon. We have Ekaite. If you understand what I'm saying, say yes. yes. May I ask you, dear teachers, how many of you can now get Ekaite to be your house girl? You can never. It may look as if this thing can never change. How will it change? Aquaibomites are born to be house boys and house girls. But I saw a governor with a vision who stood up and said, For what? And you know that when a kaite came to be house girl, you remember that they suffered a lot. Eh? That many of them were not only house girls, but they became victims of sexual molestation. From the yoga of the household. You remember. When a governor rose up. And said enough is enough. Our sons and our daughters. Were born. Not to be house boys and house girls. But to do something with their lives. Now you can't find a kite to be your house girl. As I was praying for this program. The Lord said in my heart. Who is it that will rise up. To change the fortunes of our sons and daughters. In Delta State. Who is it that will look beyond salary and see his classroom as a, a, a breeding ground for a new generation of Delta children? 
There cannot be a transformation of any place until there is a transformation of the young people. The transformation of the young people is what actually brings serious transformation in any land. Because this is the opening charge, let me take two scriptures and trust that the Lord will finish what he has started in the name of Jesus. Now please, I want you to understand that Delta State, Delta State is in God's plan and God's agenda. And those children under our care, it may not look at like it may not look at like it yet. Maybe sometimes, even as a teacher, your salary is not paid for a while. Don't let it bother you. There will be a change. Oh, I didn't hear a believing amen. amen. Maybe you are even working in a private school that your proprietor or your proprietress doesn't even appreciate your effort. Please, I want you to note that the one for whom you are working. He's not that proprietor. A man can do anything if he catches a vision of who gave him that assignment. A man can do anything. Look at our sons and our daughters. Look at our sons and our daughters. Does it not pain you that Deltans are becoming the leaders in Yahoo all over the nation? Look at our sons and our daughters. Tramadol. All kinds of hard drugs. Look at our sons and our daughters. And you as a, a parent, you may think my children are safe. I brought them up well. Don't rejoice too quickly. Don't rejoice too quickly. Because that's your child that you are boasting that is safe. You are not tying him in the bedroom with you is going to interact outside who will change who will change the destiny of this state and it may appear that uh, but I am just a small classroom teacher I'm only handling a few students what difference can I make do you know that that class you are handling is enough if you will handle it well say amen if you will handle that class well, it's okay. We know that all serious formal education, all serious formal education is within the age bracket that God has called us into. And you know the age is reducing year by year. Now six months left, they go to school. Am I right? Uh -huh. A child has not even known how to finish breastfeeding. is already learning ABC in class, which is really a tragedy. You remember that in those days when Western education came, for you to go to primary one, what was the measurement? I don't know how they knew that. That somehow when you are growing up, your limbs will be growing pari pasu. So if your hand doesn't touch your ear, they know you have not reached six years. Go and sit at home. Those of you that are young moms here, I want you to know that carrying your children and going to dump them somewhere. Is a very wrong direction to go. But that's not my talk right now. What I want to say to you is that the age bracket for formal education, let's take it say from three. From three and maybe to 21 years. These are critical years. Do you notice that when a child gets to university, like I'm teaching the higher institution, do we flog children in the university? No. Why? Because we are assuming that the child has been formed. It's not at this age now that we want to start doing all those things. We are supposed to be building on what has already been laid. And that is why, please, if you are teaching at the lower level, I want you to know that your task, ah, God is counting on you seriously. So in conclusion, what is the challenge for us as Christian teachers? What is the challenge for us as Christian teachers. The challenge is that the devil knows that the best time to damage a life is in the formative years. The best time to damage a life is in the formative years. Those of you that are parents, please let me quickly say to you, the first six years of your child's life, don't play with it. The first six years 
of your child's life. Don't play with it. Let me ask. A child who sucks thumb. Either sucking thumb or a child that sucks them. Have you seen those children? And they were not stopped when they were young. When the man is 40 years, can you stop him that time? No, but because the man is older, he is wiser, so he likes to be to conduct, comport himself. But once in a while, you know they will forget. Before they don't. At 40 years. If you see any man or any woman who lacks direction at 40 years, it will take a miracle for him to get direction ever in his life. If you see anybody who has arrived at 40 years, whatever habit he learned before he got to that age can never be changed. Why? Because they have been permanently engraving in his life. They can't go away again. And that is why when we have the privilege of dealing with these children at the early age, when we can still write into their lives, we must never ever take it for granted. You know that many marriages fail in their formative years. You know some of you, you have daughters that you will not allow to cook because you have house girl. Only for Ungozi to marry and doesn't know how to turn to make Eba successfully. We didn't know that we were already creating a disaster for the future. Anything, life principles that were not imputed into a human being in those formative years, it becomes a lost cause as that person is growing older. So as a Christian teacher, God has placed you at this critical age bracket where men's destinies are formed. So, one thing I saw about God, as this child is saying, oh God, oh my teacher, inscribe your law in my heart. God also likes to inscribe things and I will show you. God also likes to write Let's look at it. And that's where we are going to close this opening charge. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. If you look at Hebrews chapter 8, I'd like to read from verse 7. Hebrews 8 verse 7. For if that first covenant had been, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said... Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. I will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God. And they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach any man his neighbor. And every man his brother saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me. From the least to the greatest. Now what is the context of this? Relating to what we are talking about today. When the children of Israel left Egypt and they were going to the promised land. The original plan of God for them, when he told Moses, gather the men of, gather the children of Israel to the foot of the mount. His plan was that he will come and write his laws on their hearts. To write his laws on their hearts. That was the plan. But unfortunately, their hearts were not available. The Bible says when the people saw the thunder and the lightning, they were so scared, they ran away. And they said to Moses, we are too afraid to come before God. You go. Let God speak to you. Anything he tells you, come and tell us. They ran away. So when God saw that the people's hearts were not available, he said, Moses, come up to the mountain. 
And for the next 40 days and 40 nights, Moses was up there. And God, with his own hand, cl clave out two pieces of rock. And with his own finger, he wrote his laws. It was not his plan. It was not his pl original plan that his laws should be written in ordinary tablets. He wanted them to be written in the hearts of men. And you know, as Moses was coming down with those tablets, all of a sudden, the Bible says, the people had already corrupted themselves, worshipping one strange God. Moses was so angry. Before Moses came down with ten commandments, the people have already broken commandment one. And Moses came and could break every other thing. Please, brethren, may I tell you that this Bible is a wonderful book. And we thank God for the Bible. But do you know that this was not God's original plan. The original plan is that this law will be written in our hearts. He said then, when the laws are written in your heart, nobody needs to say, ah, this thing you are doing is wrong now. This thing you are doing, because it will be there, you will just be living out the laws of God. He said, but now, this is remedial. Just be using it first. How does that relate to you as a teacher? I see some of you, you have very big physics textbook, big chemistry textbook, English textbook up to four. I told my son the other day, bring your English textbook, four different textbooks, four. Physics, they recommend how many? Now, whereas this book is a good book, and whereas the physics textbook is a good book, but you know what the child in your class is crying for? Ma, sir, I don't want this thing just in a book. Can you inscribe it on my heart? Can you transfer it from a book and put it in my heart? But you know the unfortunate thing? Even the teacher himself doesn't have it in his heart. Teacher get to class. According to the law of uh, oh, what is that man's name? Oh, mm, excuse me. Yes. According to Newton's first law of motion. How many of you know it? Uh, sir, teach us first. Excuse me. Newton's first law of motion you now adjust your goggle. It says, it says that everything will remain in a state of inertia until acted upon by an external force. And because this thing is not the flesh of the teacher, this teacher has not internalized it. He cannot even use a simple example to tell the students that what this law means is that if you put this book here, it will remain there until somebody remove it. If a, a child that was in a physics class was told that this book that is here will remain here until somebody touch it, when he gets to example, will he remember Newton's law? Yes. Yes, he will because he sees a practical engagement of that law. Whereas books are good, but books are supposed to be reference materials. The teacher, who is a Christian teacher, just the way the Bible describes Jesus, the subject I'm teaching is supposed to become my flesh. When I get to the class, I know what I am teaching. When I get to the class, I know my subject. I'm not carrying textbook up and down. And that is why when we are testing our students, whether for tests, whether for exams, how do we normally do it? If that child, that child that you have taught for one term, comes into the hall with paper or with the notebook, he hides it, or he hid it there and he's spying. What do you call that? Examar practice. 
Dear teacher, do you know that you are the first exam I practice person? Because this is exam you took for four years. This is course you read for four years. And you are coming to the class. It's not at your fingertips. And this child is crying. My dear teacher, can you inscribe your law on my heart? Can you make this subject real to me? Can you inscribe your law on my heart? That's the first dimension. But the second dimension, which is also very important, if not more important, is that teacher, that Christian teacher, as God's representative to inscribe the law of God in the hearts of the children. This is a very important segment of our work. Inscribe your subjects, good, that's why you are there. But also, God is expecting, as a Christian teacher, that you will inscribe his own law, his own value system, in the hearts of your students. Christian teacher, I want you to know, um, one of the things that the Lord has asked us to do, which we've been doing, we go to secondary schools, we've been to some of your secondary schools, we go to campuses, to talk to the students because we know that a child that can be taught godly principles from primary and secondary school hardly would a child depart from it am i speaking the truth if i were to ask some of you here you gave your life to christ secondary school please if you gave your life to christ from secondary school let me see your hands secondary school look at it look at it university University. After I graduated. So you see it now. That is to say that as a Christian teacher, one of your responsibilities is to, is to engrave, is to write the law of God in the hearts of your children. And you know what I found out? Children, secondary school level, primary school level, they are so open to the gospel. Am I right? Before you say they want to repent, they want to repent. But here is the problem, which is going to lead us to pray a very serious prayer. Here is the problem. The real dilemma now is that there are many people professing to be Christian teachers who are not living the life of a Christian. Do you know, I had one of our uh, 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 members who was teaching in a particular school. And when he got to exam time, the proprietor who is a deacon in one school called them, in one church rather, and said, this is it. You remember, you are handling English. You give them the solution. You must give them solution, give them solution. And this uh, sister, I think she was teaching English. She said, no, <laughs> that's totally against my conviction. He said, we are helping the students. What is bad about that? He said, the help I would have helped them is the one I helped them to learn. This one is not mine. But do you know why many teachers cannot enforce that? Is that even the teacher, the certificate he is carrying is fake. And whereas I am teaching in a class with forged certificates, it lowers my moral prowess. The, the push to say, no, stop that. You know why as a teacher, it will be very hard for you to stop my practice in your class. Because when you were an undergraduate, from year one to graduation, that was what you did. So anytime the students are cheating, Something inside of you, when you want to tell, say, Kumamu, Kumamu, Kumamu. Just keep quiet there. When you were in the shoe, what did you do? So you are, you put yourself together again. Do you know, when you as an individual, you lack the life of morality, you lack the life of Christ, you may claim to be a Christian, you may claim to go to church. 
but inside your heart, somewhere you know that you are not living the life of Christ. And that is the real critical issue. So if God wanted to help us in this state, in the educational system, I believe that the first starting point is for every teacher to check their hearts. The starting point is for you and I to check our hearts. Have we really submitted ourselves to the governorship of heaven? Have we really submitted ourselves to the lordship of Jesus Christ? You know, many times, people think that what Jesus is interested in is that we go to church on Sunday. Do you think that's what he's interested in? I found out a long time ago, and I thank God for one of my teachers who saw that as her responsibility. Probably, I wouldn't be here today. I went to church all my life because I grew up in a Christian home. I went to church. I was very religious. I sang in the choir. I joined the GA. I joined the Lydia. I, everything they said we should join, I joined. And yet, I left church and I knew that I was not truly a child of God. I knew this. That time in Abraka, how many of you graduated from Abraka? Ah, see my people. In Abraka that time, I don't know if they still do it. When I was in a council hall, I was in council hall. There were some girls. Any morning, when they sleep, they enter around 5 a.m. Then one girl will just start with one sonorous voice. When Jesus, when Jesus comes, where will you, where will you be? When they trump, oh my God. We are, we are in my bed, I say, Jesus has come already. I'm going to hell already. I'm going to hell. The girls, they frightened me. But that one didn't mean that I changed. Until one day, one of my lecturers called me. Professor Osakwe, Mrs. G uh, Mabel. She called me, said, Vera, come. So it was after an exam, and I was doing good. So I just finished marking your scripts. As usual, you made an A. Fantastic. You take good care of your academic work. You take good care of your appearance. What are you doing about your relationship with God? And you know the woman was an SU. And you know all oh, SU people. She started. She started. She started. Hey! Where yeah, I was, I said, let this woman let me go. But do you know I thank God. That when she finished, she said, uh, you want to make any decision? I said, let me go and think about it. I said, okay. So I left. I went for vacation. Do you know throughout that vacation, sin became bitter. All the things I used to do, I enjoyed before. All of them became useless. I said, what kind of trouble is this? So when I resumed, number one, cancel hall, I will never forget. The Holy Spirit was on my case. Don't you see that you are hypocrites? Don't you see you are hypocrites? Your parents think you are a good girl? Don't you see you are hypocrites? Hey! I knelt down in my corner. I said, God, I'm tired of being a hypocrite. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a child of God. God, I have heard that you change people's lives. Please, if you change people's lives, change my life. I'm tired of being a sinner. And you know that day, Jesus came into my life. Jesus changed me. That was 10th of May of 1986. 10th of May this year will be 33 years. Yeah. So on Monday, I got to class. This was a Saturday. I got to class on Monday. And then they were making noise. They wanted to include me. I said, no, no, no. I don't do such. I'm born again. <laughs> you are what? Hey, see laughter. See laughter. Then one of them said, I beg you. How many times we have answer what that call? Who the feel they live that kind of life? I beg, leave that thing. She will soon, she will soon come back. One I said, give her three weeks. Just give her three weeks. They waited three weeks. They waited three months. Three years, I'm still here. 33 years. 33 years of an absolute unbroken walk with God. 33 years knowing that the man of Calvary lives inside of me. 33 years of knowing beyond a shadow of doubt that I am a child of God. No matter how they laughed that day, I knew. 
I knew you. I was a child of God. I knew that my life had changed. I knew I was no longer the person I used to be. Why am I telling you this story? Perhaps you go to church, but you've never had that experience of a changed life. Perhaps you go to church and supposedly you are a Christian teacher, but you know that your life has never changed. You know that your life has never changed. Do you know today, as God is saying, I'm looking for hands that I can entrust this generation of Delta youths to their hands. I wish you would respond to the Holy Spirit this morning. I wish you would say to him, yes, I have been going to church, but honestly, I know that my life is not right. There are secret sins. There are secret habits. There are secret compromises in my life. Yes, I've been going to church, but I know if I die today, today, now, I'm on my way to hell. Do you know that? Instead of saying, I beg, I beg, let's try. Is it not education we came to talk about? What God is saying is that you cannot represent him in that educational sector. If, first of all, he hasn't changed your life. Do you know that there are some supposedly Christian teachers that have done a lot of damage to young people? A lot of damage. They go to church. They go to church. The other day, a young man in a private school. These are kindergarten, small, small children. He is supposed to be somebody who goes to church. He will go to the back of the class as if he's trying to teach one small girl lesson. And tell the others, face front, face front, face front. And he's using his finger on that child. He goes to church. Do you know that if somebody is a doctor, the damage a doctor does is not much. If an engineer make a mistake, it's not much. They do road. If the road has potholes, it's just called somebody else. They would scoop out the road and replace it immediately. It's not much. But when you damage a life, it's permanent. It's permanent. This morning we are going to pray as we continue because God has very strong instructions. That's why at the inception of this meeting this morning, I told you that we didn't even have time the way we normally introduce people. We didn't have that time because I see God is in a haste to talk to us this morning. Perhaps you are here this morning and you cannot truly say you have been forgiven. You cannot truly say that your life is right with God. You cannot truly say that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Perhaps you are here and at one point you committed your heart to Jesus but somehow you have gone cold. You have gone cold. When you were in campus, you were on fire for Jesus but things have changed. I want to pray this prayer first before we continue. Can we bow our heads to pray? Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for what you want to do in this state through the teaching profession. Whereas some people may have given up on this profession, but you have not given up on us. And that is why you are calling us time and time again to bring instructions by your spirit. Lord, we want to thank you for, for this in the name of Jesus. Lord, this morning, here are your people before you. You brought them from different places. You brought them from different locations. Father, yet for each heart this morning, you are asking, you are asking, would you give me space to truly be your Lord? Lord, I'm asking you this morning, as many as you are calling into this walk with you, draw them by your spirit. Draw them by your spirit in the name of Jesus. Lord, I know that there are some people before the foundations of this world. It was already written that today, the 1st of May 2019, will be that day that they will commit their lives totally to follow Jesus. Lord, for such ones, I pray you draw them now. Thank you, Father. This teaching you just listened to was produced by Morning Star Media Group, an arm of today's Challenge International. For more information, please visit our office at number 1 Dumais Close, opposite Mosheshe Estate, Airport Road, Ephraim, or call the number 0803 205 7709.